I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that are new to our Demand Gen Jam sessions, we do have an agenda that we'll follow along. And then we've got a presentation for you uh, here in a minute. I'm super excited for the, the topic that we're going to cover today. And I'm really excited uh, about our special guest. More on that uh, in a minute. Andrea, if you don't mind, if you could just drop a link to the agenda for those that are uh, following along on Zoom. Uh, I'm not going to share my screen uh, for the most of this today because we're just going to have a conversation um, about just breaking down the gates. That's the big topic of today. And uh, and then our special guest has a presentation he's going to share with us. And so uh, let's go ahead and jump in and just welcome everybody to attending our September Demand Gen Jam session. Uh, man, we've got a special session in store for you today uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I feel like this is the age old debate, right? In B2B marketing, uh, should we gate our great content or should we ungate our great content? Which path is going to give us the best opportunity to grow our pipelines and to grow our business. Well, we're going to get a perspective on that today that I know you guys are going to really enjoy. Uh, but before I get into that, if you'll follow along on the agenda, we do have a few uh, housekeeping items I wanted to share with you. One, if you're new to the Demand Gen Jammers uh, sessions, we actually have a community on LinkedIn. We'd love for you to be a part of that as well. It's called the Demand Gen Jammers group. There's a link in the agenda. You can just click on that. Uh, it'll take you over to the group. Uh, you'll have to get approved, but we'll approve everybody uh, that's here. And it's just a great way for us to extend the conversation uh, in between these monthly jam sessions that we do. So if you haven't joined, uh, please join us for that. Uh, and then I just want to quickly introduce uh, the cast of characters today. Uh, my co-host, Ryan Miller, our SVP of Sales and Marketing, is here to help facilitate the conversation today. Say hi, Ryan. Hey, guys. Love this one today, and you're going to love it, too. Yeah. And then we've got uh, Andrea, who is going to be moderating and managing chat for us. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat, and I'll queue them up. We've got time at the end. And then I really want to give a very warm welcome to our special guest, Chuck Moxley. He is the uh, CMO of Blue Triangle and an author of uh, the book, An Audience of One. And one of the things I'm so excited about Chuck being here today, uh, one, it just kind of shows the value of uh, where the world is going. Chuck and I actually met on LinkedIn. If it weren't for social media and kind of the new uh, way that, that modern marketers learn about products or services or learn about uh, connecting with peers, uh, Chuck and I wouldn't even be here today. Uh, so excited about that. But really, one of the things I, and Chuck's got a lot of great stuff to share with us. But the thing I really love about Chuck being here today is as a CMO, he's actually going to be the first uh, guest that we've ever had uh, that's been in your seat. You know, obviously we have a lot of CMOs that come to these sessions uh, to listen in, uh, but Chuck is living and breathing what you guys are living and breathing every day. Uh, he made the the brave choice uh, not too long ago to the shift from gated content to ungated content. And so I'm really excited for him to share the real world perspectives um, that he is going to share with us today. You want to say hi, Chuck? Hi, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you here, too, as well, Chuck. And I got to look at his slides uh, last night, and I know that uh, you guys are in for a treat. And so just moving on the agenda, because I know we've got a lot, Chuck's got a lot to share with us today. Um, we're going to be in inbound next week. So if anybody's going to be uh, in inbound next week, uh, just chat in inbound. We'd love to we'd love to know that you're there and we'll try to reach out to you uh, and connect with you while we're there. I'm actually heading out uh, on Monday. I'll be there through Friday um, uh, until Ryan Reynolds, I think, is uh, closing out the session Friday afternoon and then I'll be heading to the airport. Uh, but uh, Ryan, this is your first trip to inbound, right? You're muted, buddy. Well, please. Uh, I was yelling. It didn't work. You can't break that. Yeah, I'm super excited to go. So I'm very, very excited to bring back some learnings to you guys. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, you want to get the conversation started, Ryan, with some uh, chat discussions? Yeah. So guys, if you want to just chat in your thoughts, this one's, uh, like I said, it's kind of divisive today, but it's a lot of fun. So are you camp gated or ungated? Where are you right now? Kind of where do you believe? What do you think is the right thing and just give us a little bit of rationale behind it doesn't have to be crazy uh, so that's the first one uh, the second one is like what are your biggest concerns about ungating content so if you're like a lot of companies who have a lot of things gated you really depend on certain things from that i'm not going to lead the witness here but what are some of your primary concerns around ungating your gated content 
Yeah, chat those in. And just a, one thing I wanted to touch on, uh, last week I put a poll out on LinkedIn. I was just curious. And I just uh, asked, you know, basically the question Ryan just asked, are you camp gated or are you camp ungated? Are you seeing, regardless of which camp you're in, are you seeing your pipeline grow um, or not? And if you are camp gated or ungated, are you just not able to tell one way or the other? And we were talking about this kind of in the green room yesterday, getting ready for today's session. Uh, we, I was actually surprised. Almost 60 percent of the people that uh, took the poll on LinkedIn last week, we had, I think, 40 or 50 responses to it, um, said that they're actually ungating their content. But a huge percentage of those in camp gated or camp ungated were not clear on whether or not it was working. So, Chuck, I know you're going to talk about some of that today on how you guys are measuring whether it's working or not. So. Uh, very cool stuff. And next on the agenda, just to move us along here, um, we are having a live event, a physical event uh, in Dallas. So for those of you that are in Dallas, or if you know of anybody in Dallas on October 3rd, which is a Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m., we'll be hosting a happy hour. We'd love for you to come. Uh, the tickets are actually $56 uh, per person. That's just to cover the cost of the facilities and the food and the, the beer and the wine that we'll be serving there. Uh, but Ryan and I will actually be leading a 2025 planning session. So if you're thinking about, you know, what are the go-to-market motions I need to be focusing on for 2025? What are some of the latest trends I need to be thinking about? And you happen to be in the Dallas area, we'd love for you to come join us. And we do have a handful of VIP tickets, so we can get you in there for free so you don't have to pay the 56 bucks. Uh, but just reach out to Ryan or me on that, and we can get you those VIP tickets. So if you're in Dallas, October 3rd, we'd love to see you. And we are going to do one in Denver. Do you remember the date on in the Denver one, Ryan? It's November 7th, Thursday, November 7th. Thursday, the November 7th. Uh, more to come on that. We don't even have a landing page set up for that one yet. Um, and then our next jam session will actually be on Wednesday, October the 16th. And uh, as I mentioned already, we're going to inbound. And so um, for those of you that aren't able to go to inbound, we're going to basically dedicate our October session to all the cool stuff that we learned since you weren't able to go. We're going to go, we're covering so many different sessions. And it's not just about HubSpot. There's a lot of good information that we learn every year there. And so we're going to kind of condense that down to the stuff that we thought was the most valuable. And we're going to bring that guy, that back to you guys um, next month. And I think we'll even have like access to some of the slides and things like that um, that we're giving out during the session. So it'll almost be like going to inbound, except Ryan Reynolds won't be uh, in our October session, unfortunately. And he's the keynote at inbound. But hey, that's OK. Um, all right. I think that covers all of our. Uh, housekeeping items. Let's go ahead and jump into the general discussion today. And, uh, you know, I thought we came up with a pretty, pretty interesting topic, you know, breaking down the gates, you know, a CMO's journey to content freedom. Uh, and that's certainly what we're going to be covering today. And as I mentioned, Chuck's got a great presentation that I want to get us to as quickly as possible. But I thought we'd just have a, a good, just general discussion on, uh, you know, content marketing, gating, ungating, why this stuff is important. Uh, and I think a great segue into that, Chuck, is just help us understand your book. I know your book is really all about the frictionless journey, if you will, and speaking to, you know, an audience of one. Tell me a little bit about why you wrote the book, what the book's about. That'd be great. Sure. And so the book, which you'll see pictured on the above my shoulder, if you're watching the video, it's called An Audience of One, and it's all about how brands are moving from traditional uh, mass marketing techniques to one-to-one -to -one marketing. And so we cover, and, and this came out of, we spent, uh, I spent seven years with a company where we were very involved in digital identity. And, uh, you know, I learned a ton. We were working with major consumer brands, CPG brands, et cetera. And then uh, my co-author, Jamie Turner, and I started chatting and saying, you know, there's so much and so much not known about this. It might be time for a book. We started writing the book and um, the goal there was to try to, because it's a mindset change. It's a mindset change to start to think about that one-to-one. -one. And it's true for whether you're B2B or B2C. And so our audience for the book is both both sides of it. Um, and again, at the time, we were working with a lot of B2C marketers. But it was great. We we wrote three or four chapters. Um, and then Jamie, who's it's his fourth book, my first, he submitted it to three publishers. We got two offers, and we ended up uh, going with McGraw-Hill, who published it about two years ago. And so it's been a lot of fun. And because there was no Bible on this for 
colleges. It's actually taught at a number of colleges now wow, in the business program, the business marketing program. And I've actually gotten to guest lecture at colleges all over the world as part of it. So it's fun. Yeah, that's great. And by the way, I do have a link in the agenda to the book so you can buy it at Amazon. And, uh, and, uh, that's awesome. So uh, glad to have you and, and glad to have an author, not only a CMO, uh, uh <laughs> that's here today, but also, uh, an author. And, and it's great because I don't know how colleges can keep up with the, the rapid change of the way buyer behavior is changing, the way the digital is changing the, the, the go to markets for B2B and B2C. So I think that's an awesome thing that your book is actually being taught in colleges. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's an honor really. Um, so hopefully one day I'll be hiring, you know, people who, who, who uh, <laughs> read your uh, book, use the book in school and then, you know, it'll be like a full circle moment. Yeah. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. That's great. So looking at this thing, big picture again, gated versus ungated, like for, this is kind of for all of us, you guys can chat and stuff too, but why is this so important? Why is this such an important topic for us as B2B marketers and sales and everybody to kind of spend the time that we need to spend on this? What do you guys think? Well, I'll comment that uh, for years, a gated model worked. It actually, it actually worked. And, you know, if, if you go back in time, our, our, we used to talk about how many leads did we drive? How many, you know, it's uh, uh, MQLs. And we talked about all the terminology because the concept worked. People were willing to go through the gate if they wanted the piece of content. So I think, and I, somebody mentioned in comments that they're coming around to, for years, I had this debate with my team because I kept wanting, no, 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 we want the gate. We want the email address. We want the data to be able to now sequence those people and talk to them later and to be able to demonstrate that we were doing something with the money, right? Then mm -hmm. we could have a cost per MQL, cost per lead, et cetera. Uh, and it justified the marketing expense. So I think it was so ingrained for so many years, it's a hard shift to make. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, that reminds me, Chuck, I just think about, um, I think you nailed it. Uh, even as, you know, an agency, we loved gated content, right? Because we could run campaigns to a gated ebook and prove that the dollars that a client was paying to us was working. And, uh, and it did work for many years. I mean, we've been a digital agency for 20 plus years and, and, uh, and it was a great way to spend a client's money, uh, generate leads, prove that we're, um, valuable to them. But then really it, it seems like I keep always pointing back to COVID, but to me, when, when COVID happened, digital transformation happened, it kind of forced digital transformation to happen. And all of a sudden, um, especially in the world of B2B, um, people began to understand that they could go to sites like LinkedIn, they could connect to their peers, they could be in communities and get access to knowledge that they used to have to pay for with their contact information. And so all of a sudden, to the buyer, it wasn't worth it to me so much to fill out this form uh, in order to get information, because I could just reach out to Chuck on LinkedIn and say, hey, Chuck, what about this? What about that? And he, you'd go, oh, here's something that might be useful to you. And so I think buyer behaviors changed it quite a bit as well. Julia. For sure. Julia, got your hand up. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I think this will be a very interesting conversation. Um, to your question there, Ryan, and I echo everything you just said, Paul, uh, in addition to that, I think this is a much more complex conversation is why it's so important is because it's not just gate or on gate to somebody's comment in the, in the, um, in the chat, I think it's like, you have to think through attribution. You have to think about how are you going to get their information? You have to think about the tools, the legacy tools that were built for gating that people have as part of their MarTech stack that they put in 10 years ago. And do they want to, like pull all that out and do something else, or they're you know they're Frankensteining their Martech stack, and there's all of these um, I don't want to say consequences, but there's considerations for so many elements of the marketing function that it's bigger than just gate or ungate. What kind of content are you creating? To your point, um, uh, Paul, of like they can go get it someplace else. They can just Google it. They can chat GPT it. What's the the tech stack? And then you have, I haven't even started of like the education of the C-suite uh, that's who, a big one. or the sales organization oh, yeah. that's like, get it, get it, get it. I need people. I need people. I need people. So it's, I love this topic because I, yes, it's controversial, but I think sometimes too, we forget that it's not just like, Hey, it's a conversation of gate versus ungate. It's a conversation about technology, 
um, culture shift, content shift, digital shift. Where do we get, we have to capture these someplace people somewhere along the buyer journey. How do we do that differently? Forcing people to think outside of the box. So uh, first off, thank you for having this topic because I think it's uh, a very profound one, but also yeah. just how you have to think about so many other factors. Julia, that's so, actually a great segue into the next topic, which is, is there ever a good, a, a good time to gate? Um, you know, because it's, you know, do you ungate everything? Do we just completely let it all go um, and never put a form in front of something? Or are there times when it makes sense uh, to add a form? And, uh, you know, as, as you were talking about, you know, we built our go-to-markets on gated content. And so it's almost like, if I think of like a series of dominoes that, that you know, when you were a kid, you kind of stacked them together and would push them over. If we pull one of the dominoes out, all of a sudden, you know, our go-to-market strategy is not going to work as well because we kind of needed that thing to help move buyers along. And so it is, it is really challenging. And so let's just continue that discussion and just think about, you know, uh, Chuck, I'd love your perspective of, you know, what, when should we gate? Is there ever a time? to gate? Yeah, it's a great question. And somebody brought it up in the LinkedIn exchanges this week. And, and it, we have ungated all of our content, but only because we don't have some of the content that I would, I would consider gating. One, one was somebody pointed out, and I think this is right, is first is original research. At my last couple of companies, we actually produced our own benchmarks from hundreds of customer data, millions of data points that was unique to the industry that we could then use in press and all. And it got picked up by, you know, research organizations that became data that was, you know, used by the industry. In that case, I feel like you can get away with gating because nobody else has it. Somebody on here said content's a commodity. That's non-commodity content. If it's original research, you cannot get somewhere else and it's compelling research. I think you've got a, a legitimate point of view for gating that. And that's a great way to get some email addresses, get them, you know, the ability to do follow-up, et cetera. I think the second example that I've seen from my past my last couple of companies, I've also licensed reports from Gartner or Forrester. You know, it, it, there were industry reports. It may or may not have been a report that featured us. It might not, not have been a magic quadrant, for example. That data is perceived very high value. It was always our number one converting asset. Oh, and wow. it worked in everything from with our sales team, with marketing, et cetera. So I think those are two strong examples that if I had them, which I don't, in my current company. But if I had either of those, I would probably gate those. So you know what that boils down to is the fair exchange of value, mm. right? It's highly commoditized. Like look at B2B content, man, there's 10,000 agencies from single shields all the way to mega agencies and consulting firms. It's not a lot of new information, right? So if we're going to ask for your, for your contact information, we're probably not going to get it. And it's not going to be that great of a contact anyways. Versus what you're saying, Chuck. So that's that fair exchange of value. So if it's unique research, if it's truly going to like add to my business and help, yeah, I will pay for that with my email. Yeah. You know, Ryan, that made me think about like content syndication, you know, content syndication today is usually sold on a cost per lead and you go in and you, you know, you pick your audience that you're trying to reach and, and, uh, all these different selections. And then they come back and say, okay, that'll be $30 a lead or $40 a lead. And they'll go and, and push your content out to their, to that audience. And then you get the leads back. And so that kind of sets the value, if you will, of what a lead is worth for content. So to your fair exchange of value, I'm almost thinking, you know, hey, would somebody pay 40 bucks for this thing that I've got that I'm going to make them fill out a form to get? And if I feel like it's worth at least 40 bucks or more, then maybe we do add a gate. Maybe that's something, a good way to think about it. I hadn't thought about it that way until I heard you, uh, your comments, Ryan. Another thing like to think that. about around that is, can we produce uh, conversion opportunities where we need their information in order to fulfill the thing that they want from us. Like for example, these demand gen jam sessions, we need your information so that we can send you the zoom link so that you can come join us so that we can send you the replay and all the resources that come out of this event. So we need your information in order to fulfill the promise of this event. And so in a way it's, it's almost a requirement because we can't serve you the way we want to serve you without it. Um, another thing that we've tried are these, what I call content upgrades. So if you've got 
you know, a really good long form piece of content, maybe you could create a cheat sheet or a checklist or something like that and just promote that as a, hey, give us your email address, we'll deliver you this checklist. So those are just other ways that we might think about things that we could gate that would be a fair exchange of value to use your term, Ryan. Uh, good mm -hmm. conversation. Any, any other parting thoughts before we move on? The last one. We as marketers is one of the main reasons to blame that people don't want to give up email addresses to get content. We all have to look in the mirror and go, man, how many bad email sequences? Don't say that. Many, don't say that. Stop. How many times have we beat some poor person over the head because they filled out a form to get a piece of content? How many times do they get touched by sales? So the 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 preach there is we all have to hold ourselves accountable to doing really the one-to-one -one stuff, you know, at scale, but like being more personal, being more respectful of their inboxes and time. We challenge ourselves with that all the time. Uh, but how do we, again, bring that value back to them in a way that's like, oh God, I'm not filling out this form because I know what's going to happen, but I need this. Uh, yeah. Shouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Marketers are the worst, man. As soon as we find new attention, we ruin it. We go in there and we just ruin it. <laughs> well, well, let's well, quickly Mark cover the, the last. What's that? Going? We use temp mail and I don't even like give my email anymore. Yeah. Like, why should I? I can use temp email and get the thing that I want and go on my way without ever having to worry. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great point, Julia. Hey, Ryan, let's cover that last topic pretty quick because I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for Chuck's presentation. Yeah. And really, like, Julia, you summed up a lot of this next topic is it's like it's not just about removing the forms. There are 16,000 other things you kind of have to think through. And the big buckets really is like that that shift in mindset, executive buy-in, because you're about to change some significant metrics, right? Especially if you're like a publicly traded company, that's a big deal. Um, there's a shift in how you uh, track the behavior, right? So your tech stack has to be better. Your attribution has to get better. Your understanding of how to connect the dots has to get better. So there's a lot in there um, and from a journey perspective, right? You're now in the unknown. So how how do you leverage modern marketing and, and data and visibility to tell the whole story so that when you get a conversion, you can tie it back to that person read something? Yeah, good point. Chuck, how about you? Any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, it definitely takes a rethink. It's actually one of the five lessons that I'm gonna cover is how we had to not only rethink how we tracked our progress and how we proved our value as a marketing team and what we were spending, but also reset expectations. Because I'm, I'll am i be the first to say, when I joined the company, all I heard was, we need top of funnel leads. We need top of funnel leads. I was hearing that every week. I was hearing that from the salespeople. I was hearing that from the CEO. And today we don't talk in terms of leads. We don't ever report on MQLs. We had to change all of that behavior and those expectations. So it is not easy. It is it is not easy. And I fully re recognize because I, I have a lot of um, people that I work with in much larger companies. It's a lot harder to do in a big company. I'm fortunate that we're a small company, yeah. right? And so I appreciate, and we're not public. We're not, you know, the large corporation that I have, you know, t 10 chains up. So I do appreciate that it is hard and that somebody just commented about change management. It's hard yeah. to get people to rethink that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the last comment here, and then we can get to your presentation is when, when you ungate, that's a brave step, um, but your content's got to deliver. I mean, more than ever, right? Because when you have the form, um, you're they're going to have to give you something before they get, right? Because they're going to give you their contact information. Then you're going to have to deliver it. And maybe it's good, maybe it's not. But when you're not gating, you've really got to deliver on great content. So just think about what can you do to amp up your content uh, so that it is su super high quality that they're going to want to share internally with their buyer committees. And so, Chuck, so, why don't we do this? Let's oh, go ahead and jump quick. over. Yeah, go I, I got to leave one, one nugget. And you guys can chat this in as we get to Chuck's thing. But the question is, what happens when you ungate crappy content? I'm just going to leave that. We're just going to leave it there. <laughs> yeah, just throw it out there. We can have that conversation on chat. That's a good one, Ryan. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so Chuck, yeah, go ahead and share your presentation and uh, let's get into it. Am I sharing the right screen? I'm not. Yeah, you're yeah. looking good. It's the full screen. Um, you're seeing the full slide? Yeah. Or you're are. seeing the slide presenter? You're, okay. No, I'm, we're seeing good. you and we're seeing good, your good, good. Okay. I, I can't tell from the various screens. <laughs> yeah, that's so, okay. uh, so, and, and by the way, I will say to your point, uh, it, Ryan, 
the, I think content marketing, we sometimes focus too much on the marketing, not enough on the content. Yeah. And so, and that's an easy thing to fall into. So there is some, some, some power there. So just a quick preamble. Uh, again, uh, I'll talk about what brought us here and what caused us to to make this shift. And uh, it started uh, in Q1 of 2023. So I've actually got about 18 months of data that I'll be able to share. So we had time to kind of see where it went. Um, but it, 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 what, what really caused me to want to share this was as I was talking to some of my uh uh, partners at other companies, they were kind of me going, how did you do that? How did you justify it? All this stuff. So I actually wrote a series of LinkedIn posts. It started out as a LinkedIn post that turned out to be too many characters long. So then I <laughs> turned into a series of LinkedIn posts and then a LinkedIn article and they, they blew up the comments, the, the views and all that. So there seems to be a lot of interest in it. And then I was really happy that Paul reached out and invited me to share it today. So let me first, so again, I'm chief marketing officer at a company called Blue Triangle. I guarantee you nobody, well, Almost guarantee you nobody on this call has ever heard of the company. Um, but we, and we are, so just briefly, and this is a, a sort of a screenshot from a video that we do, but we help large scale enterprise websites quantify the cost of friction. So when you go, if you go to a home goods store online and you're trying to buy something and the page is slow or the button doesn't work or the content shifting and you have so much problem, what do you do? You jump to the next home goods store website and you complete your purchase there. We actually measure how much revenue that is costing that original retailer and losing by page. And what you'll find on some of these large scale websites, there could be a hundred pages that have problems there might be five that are producing or costing them $10 million a month. All the rest are maybe 200,000. So let's focus on these five pages, fix this. And then we, we show them how to fix it. And then we show them how to quantify how much revenue they got back. So that's what we do as a company, again, very niche. And I'm telling you this, not because I'm selling blue triangle, but I am, uh, I am uh, giving you the caveat that my learnings, because this is the first time I've done ungated content, come from my situation. My situation may not be your situation. It is not PLG, for example. So here's some things to understand. We only sell to enterprise brands, typically. You have to have a million people come to your website a month to get full value out of our platform. So we really focus on, and probably our, our TAM is about 1,500 companies, US-based companies in nine verticals. Our average uh, ARR, our average um, total contract value, whatever whatever number you want to use, is large. It's a six-figure number. We are no PLG, right? We're not product-led growth. We don't have people come and get a free trial. It's the way we work because you have to place a tag on your website, and we're dealing with enterprise brands. You have to go through security audits and a lot of things. So there's, it's a sales-led model with a lot of people involved, both on our side and on the brand side. It's a very long sales cycle, 6.9 months, actually, um, which I just rounded up to seven. So it's a very involved, long sort of process. And then the final thing that makes this a challenge is we are not rip and replace. There is nobody going out and looking for a solution that does what ours does. We have to make them problem aware that the solutions they have that we work alongside and connect with are not giving them the information that would allow them to do this quantification piece and allow them to do some of the things that our platform can. It's a hard pitch because you are having to go find new budget. You're not typically replacing an existing solution. We can't go do a lot of pay-per-click and get buyers already searching. So I just will give you that caveat that, that your situation may be different. <laughs> Results may vary, you know, whatever, whatever fine print we want to put on it. But, but this is learnings given that as our, as our background. Now, why change playbooks? And this is something that I fundamentally believe. It's something that we covered in our book um, that B2B buying and selling has changed dramatically over the years. And it's true about B2C, by the way. Buyers are in control and they're powered by data. And Forrester actually talked about this, gosh, it's probably been almost 10 years ago. We actually featured some of those charts in the book about how the power had shifted. It used to be you brands could control pricing, what you knew about the product, how you bought it, where, where you could buy it, all that kind of stuff. As the world changed and the internet changed, and this is true for both B2B and B2C, you could now go read reviews from other people or go connect with other people on LinkedIn and find out what they're doing or, or get information on social. You could go comparison shop. You could go to review sites. There are so many different ways that buyers have to learn about your product 
that we aren't in control of. And so this idea of gating content, right, makes us in control, except are we hurting ourselves? We're not really in control anymore, are we? We are not. I, I wish we were. But, but you know, we adapt, right? And that's that's what we've done. They've also grown wary of ads, emails, LinkedIn pitch slaps. You know, how many people reach out to you and you just go, I, I have to do a lot of research to go, is this person trying to sell me or do they genu genuinely want to connect and learn and exchange information? If it's the latter, I'm happy to connect. If they want to sell me something, I really don't don't want to connect. Um, so that 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 whole world has has um what's what's what i'm looking for it's it's solely to our opinion of all that right plus we don't trust we don't trust ads we don't trust that kind of stuff we trust our coworkers much more we join demand groups on linkedin or on um slack and ask people hey has anybody tried xyz solution i'm thinking looking at it thinking about it and you get a bunch of people piling on going oh it's crap oh it's awesome it's the best thing since i spread the seller will jump in but at least you get all those different opinions um, the AI powered outreach, the blessing, I guess, that AI is that now allows companies to do thousands and thousands of emails that are personalized is, has our inboxes blowing up. It's annoying us. It's very hard. Deliverability is a point pain if you're doing it. Um, it's, it's a, one more channel that we don't really have available to us anymore. And then there's, when we think about technology, because we're, again, we're a B2B SaaS company, there are too many solutions and too few budgets to go around. We constantly battle though. We've got 20 tech solutions. Can't some of these other solutions do what your solution does? Why do I need to pay for yours as well? So it's a challenge and trying to understand that everybody looks the same. The final reason is that, and this data comes from Gartner, People want to be so in control, and they talk about this dark funnel, right? People want to be in control of that buying process that it's only the last 17% of the selling process is when they will engage with you. They want to do all that research beforehand. And I've got data later to share from some other sources about how many times they have to engage with you and your content before they will do the dreaded fill out the demo form and know now they have to talk to a salesperson. Um, and again, this is sales-led growth model, obviously. So that was that was behind this, you know, and then as we were out there and and again, the traditional lead gen model has worked well for me for a decade. <clears throat> and I've got, you know, tons of years and, you know, spent millions in that that model. It's worked. But, you know, in my ear, the last two years is everybody out there talking about it. And people like Chris Walker of Refine Labs and uh, Latini, I think I got her name right, Conant, Conant from Sixth Sense. And she did the book, No Forms, No Spam, No Cold Calls. I actually read that. I gave that book to my whole team. And I started, as we were going out with this model, and we started seeing issues, we started looking at it. So I wanted to share with you five lessons. And it covers a lot of things we talked about in the opening, about how do you justify, how do you change perception in the company? All of these were things that we learned from engaging our content. All right, lesson number one, it's more efficient. And this is kind of the genesis of our story. Q1 2023, when we launched we our first campaign and this first marketing we had done in a while, we ran um, ads for five weeks, and this is just one of the things we were doing. We had a new ebook that we created called Three Hacks to Frictionless Experiences. And so we went out, we ran ads on, I think most of this was LinkedIn at this point, although today we run on other, other platforms. So the, this is the data, right? So we spent five weeks, we spent $15,000, we got 106 people to complete the form and download the content. Notice how many people came to the page versus how many people completed the form. It was a huge drop off, right? Wow, bigger, that's huge. I mean, that is unbelievable, yeah, that, right? 3,400 people and only 106 downloads. That's pretty crazy. Right. So that means that what, uh, 3,300 people said, nah, not worth it. I don't, yeah, I don't exactly. trust you enough. I don't know who you are. I don't know if it's gonna be valuable. I don't wanna be have a salesperson calling me. So the other problem that we were seeing was the data was bad. People were just giving us crap stuff. And I, 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 I do a podcast on called The Frictionless Experience. And my co-host and I had a whole conversation one day about fake emails. And he's like, what's your fake email? And I'm like, I don't use a fake email. I'm a marketer. I would never do that to another marketer, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and just make it up. <laughs> and I see a hand going up. Some people would. Uh, you know, the new, uh, the, they've got, I, I don't know if it's Google or somebody has the ability to do a fake e or a separate email that is whatever. I just did that for the first time this week, I will say, because I didn't want, I wanted to be able to disconnect easily if I, if I didn't want to do it. But I will tell you, this was actual data 
pulled out of HubSpot. And what we're getting was just not great data. And in fact, probably half of the people who submitted, we put them on a follow-up sequence and they failed because they were undeliverable emails. So as we started looking at this, and I, again, I had had everybody in my ear, I went back to the team. I said, let's just test it. Let's not do it at all, but let's test it. Let's take the same ebook and we use a platform. I'll share the, the tech we use that the, see how that's in a frame there. And if you use the little mouse back and forth, it flips it just like a flip book. And what's great is we also get data on how many pages, how much time they spend with it, et cetera. On the back end, the, the tool is called Issue, I-S-S-U-U. -S 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 it's, it's under 50 bucks a month. It's not an expensive tool. So probably everybody can afford it. But we use that to put it on basically a landing page that has no gate. And so we took the book, we put it there. And this is the data that we saw in two and a half weeks of running it. We spent another $2,000. We had obviously a hundred percent and what we, what we view today, and I, I don't, I can't tell you if in that, at this point we were using this threshold, but today they have to spend at least 30 seconds or consume two pages of an ebook for us to consider that engagement. So if they hit the page and they bounce, we don't want to count that because that's not legit, right? That's no different than the 3,300 people that came to the page and never downloaded it. But um, 175 people came up, 175 people consumed it. And our cost was only $11.44 instead of $143. That gave me the confidence to say, this is definitely more efficient. I don't have a huge marketing budget, so I'm going to lean in on this. We're going to start testing this and trying this more. Eventually, and it took us a, maybe a month or two, we ungated all of our content. And we continued running ads. And we ran ads to a bunch of different things, a different piece of content, different eBooks, you know, different blog posts, et cetera. But we kind of, when you... When you get out of, you have to do an ebook that is gated, right? Because you mm -hmm. have to have something worth gating and you could send them to a blog post and other things. And again, I'll talk about how we report on that. It kind of opened our world to all the things we could send them to a podcast episode, other things that, that, that allow us to still get tracking data. No. So at the end of the year, I looked at the year to date data and we did a bunch of things. We, we did a bunch of different ads, not just ebooks. Um, our cost in that Q1 test, and so that that data I showed was on a single ebook. We spent more money in Q1 on other things. We spent basically $287 per lead. So there we were doing leads. We now call it engagement, cost per CPE, cost per engagement. And engagement for us is either, again, on an ebook, they spend 30 seconds or, or three pages or two pages or more, or they come to our website and they, they either go to more than one page if they come to the homepage, or they go to certain pages like platform pages and things that would, or demo pages that indicate some sort of level of interest in it. We count that as an engagement. And so on average last year, we were spending for the rest of the year, $28 per engagement. And for us, what we came to realize was, look, we have a small media budget. Why are we stopping people from engaging this content? They were interested enough to come. Right. And then we go, mm, you want to see it? Maybe, maybe <laughs> not. And they go, ah, I'm out, peace out. And then they go on and they go look at other things. If we could get them to engage with the content, and I, you know, I was going to throw this in. We actually, with our own platform, we will look at customer journeys. One of the other data points, I wish I'd remembered to include this, was the bounce rate after people come to our home, to one, that one page, the, 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 bounce rate that I showed earlier, the 3,300 people, they were bouncing, right? They weren't going to other pages. So what we started looking at in our customer journeys after we made this change was what happened after they came to this page and the number of pages went up by 5X that they consumed. Wow. So we got them to consume the content. They got value from it and now it made them interested to go learn more about the platform. So we were, we were without realizing it, working against ourselves. We were stopping the people we wanted to sell to from learning more about our product. Yeah, you know, Chuck, just looking at this slide, $287 a lead to $28 per engagement. I mean, you've just lowered your cost by a factor of 10x or a tenth of the cost. I mean, think of how much more you could do with those dollars now that you're not focused on getting them uh, to fill out a form. And that was our goal. How do we get the most people in our ICP to learn about us? And, and and start to learn about our product and getting interested in it. And we were stopping them. We just didn't realize it, right? Until we looked at the data. Right. All right, so that was lesson one. This second lesson, now again, when 
so this was data that I had to share back with the CEO at the end of Q1 to, to start talking about. So based on this, we're going to make a change. And so I had to start re-managing expectations internally, right? And get people on board with the idea of we're not going to be producing leads. And you've got your sales force, you've got, you know, the exec team, you got a lot of people you got to convince. And so part of that was we had to rethink the marketing funnel. And there's been a ton of posts out there and comments on how the marketing funnel no longer applies, et cetera. But, you know, if you look at the traditional marketing funnel, I'm going to go through this quickly, the awareness consideration, you got to take them from, I've never heard. And by the way, I should have put a step above this of what problem I, I have yeah. a problem. What problem, right? Cause they are, they're problem unaware, especially in our, our case, but then all the way through those things. And we have the, all these traditional measures, right. That we look at lead MQL, SQL opportunity or pipeline and and then, and then deal one or close. So that was our reporting was based on that. Our thinking was based on that, right? So we had to kind of come up with a, a new model. And part of that was, you all have probably seen this. This is Gartner, uh, from Gartner. The process is no longer linear. And especially right. when you think about us in enterprise brands, there's so many people involved. By the time we get to a close one deal, there have probably been eight to 10 people involved in that that buying decision. We go through a proof of concept in almost every case. So it's a lot of people involved in a lot of processes they go through. So it no longer made sense for this linear. The other thing I have never liked about this model is it assumes a handover. Marketing goes out, they get the lead, they throw it over the wall. Hey, sales, go get it. Sales gets it, goes, this is crap. The person's not ready to buy. Uh, the marketing's giving me crap. And now you got the battle going back and forth. I've never cared for that. I've never worked under that. The last three companies, SDRs have actually been a part of marketing and not sales. And, and, and we just think of it in a completely different way of it's a process and that we work all the way as a team down the field. The SDR does not go away, die, never be heard of again after you get to that initial demo. The SDR is on every call and can always pick it back up if they go dark. And uh, that's a whole topic, but a whole nother topic. So we came up with this concept and I tried to come up with, I honestly, I tried to come up with a better metaphor and I couldn't because I am not a sports fan and I usually get in over my head when I use sports analogies, but I couldn't think of a better analogy than a football field. And if you think of the prospect as, a, as the ball, right, your goal is to get all the way down the field and across the goal line. And so all we did was just take it horizontal, the same questions that we got to answer. And again, of course, the problem unaware. And typically in most sales models, you think in terms of sellers, it's a sales job to get that ball all the way down to the end, right? He's kind of a team of his own. The problem is he's going up against a pretty strong team on the, on the other side. You've got entrenched solutions. You've got competitors that are out there going for the same dollars. You have inertia. Eh, do we really need to buy it? Are we okay with what we got? You have internal and external factors. We lost a big deal last year because of government funding change. It wasn't a government entity, but it was an entity that was highly driven off how much government funding there was. And when the big change happened, we lost the deal, right? So those are factors outside their control or our control. And typically we thought in terms of it's the seller going up against this entire team. I think about it differently because you you should have a team, right? You've got your SDR, you've got the marketing team. We can help all the way along. When we get somebody in a selling motion, we're still running ads against them. We're trying to find other buyers who may they may not be talking to and exposing them. So when they come around and say blue triangle, they go, oh, I've been seeing ads from those guys. I just listened to podcasts. I just saw, saw content from them, right? So we can have a big part in that. Our partners can influence sales, especially if for some reason we can't get it done with without the partner, we can bring them in. And then of course, customer success can be involved. We involve customer success in that POC. So they start getting an, an exposure to them. Now, the other issue you've got is the dark funnel, right? Because there's all this stuff that is going on that is not leads that you can track and all the stuff, right? That is very hard to track. So when we think about this, and the other reason, by the way, I like a football field is just like a game, the ball goes down the field and then it gets intercepted and it goes back up the field. Right. And then you got to go back down the field. And that's a lot of sales, right? Sales will get to a point, they stall out, they'll go backwards. Somebody, somebody, the champion leaves and you got to find a new champion, right? It follows that same ball down the, down the field. So we had to transition, I'm trying to go fast here. We had to transition from generating leads to generating and capturing demand. And again, it's not rocket science. There's a lot of people out there talking about it. Sorry, I went the wrong way. So we, we started thinking in terms of two distinct motions, our demand gen and our demand capture. And so demand gen has a different audience, right? Problem and solution unaware. Our demand capture are people who are now in looking to address a problem that we solve. 
And then we have different tactics in driving awareness, education, engagement with content on the front end, driving evaluation, engagement with sales on the back end. So the ideal world for us is not necessarily cold calling, but when they identify themselves or we start to see them in a evaluation mode, now we're reaching out and trying to engage with them. That would be more ideal. And so this is another way of looking at it. We use display ads, we use nurture sequences, we have a podcast, we have a bunch of content, and then that automated inbound nurture. This data comes from Sixth Sense, that when you follow this model, you have a 75% higher conversion rate, you've got a 40% greater close rate and a 50% greater uh, contract value. So we bought into that whole model. This other data is very interesting, and this is relatively new from a company called Hockey Stack, and they looked across 50 B2B SaaS companies, and they were everywhere from 5 million in ARR to a billion, so very, very size companies. And they looked at a million, 1.5 million contacts, and it takes 54 touch points to get somebody to an MQL. And in our world now, an MQL is an inbound demo request. What's interesting is we use Hockey Stack. We actually can see when somebody does come in, it lights up their whole path. And ironically, that's about what we see is about 50 to 60 touches and engagements before they ever get to, to that inbound demo request. So our data is is probably in their data, but it's also uh, matches kind up to Kind of spot it. on it's with where they're at. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the crazy part is it's 81 touches to get all the way to close one. And that depends on the ARR, right? Or ACV. The ACV of over 80,000 is 120 plus touches, which is mm -hmm. where we would be. Yeah. And look right. at that one in the middle. It's over 2,000 impressions to get yes. them through the process. I mean, lots of touches, lots of impressions in today's world. Well, and keep in mind, you may have five people or eight people involved that have to right. get all those impressions, right? Because that's what we're doing is we're running against anybody that we think might be involved in the deal once we get into sales motion. So that's, that's, we use that to reset the expectations internally. We told them we're no longer going to report MQLs and leads. We went, went maybe a month or two and I just dropped it from my reporting. And I finally got, I stopped hearing we need leads. <laughs> we don't hear that anymore. We also need a new reporting approach. And so I took the same, so as we came into 2024, for example, we had to build a model. So we had to say, well, what are we going to report on? If we can't report on leads, we got to report on something, right? We got to show proof, proof of life before we get to pipeline. So we identified these stages was first engagement. Could we get them to the website one time? And we can tell this because we get six cents data through hockey stack. So we can tell the company, right? Cause we're selling to accounts. So we know when that comp that account company comes to the website for the first time. Side note, we are testing RB to B, which gives you person level, which has been super interesting. Whole nother tangent. I won't go into, but uh, on this call, but, but we looked at first engagement. When can we get them to come to the website one time and engage with us? The second is, can we get them to come back either the same person coming back multiple times or multiple people? The third step is, can we get them to an actively assessing? And we determine that based on what content they're consuming. If they're going to multiple platform pages, if they're going to demo request pricing, anything like that, that indicates they're not just coming and checking out a blog post, but they're actually in evaluation phase, we could put them in that phase and report on that. Then we obviously get to a demo meeting, whether inbound or outbound. We get to a proof of concept and then we get to close one and they become, they don't become pipeline for us until after that first demo meeting, after we determine mm. they're qualified, they, they meet enough of the criteria. So when we set out the year, we gave us assessments for this. And if the 56 seems incredibly random number, it's because we worked backward and we put in what we could spend on media. And then we determined what it was going to cost us per engagement to get them there. And that kind of gave us that 56% of, and by the way, we had to scale down our ICP because our budget was low enough mm. um, that we had to focus on the 478 best prospects for the year. So that, that 56% is based on 478 as the starting point. So, so we did that. And then the other thing we did to do the model was we factored in our time, right? Because we were trying to see if with this media, could we get to enough close one sales? Could we get to enough pipeline that would, feed what we needed. What's interesting is on this is uh, we are right now at this point in the year, 72% of the, of the uh, first engagement at the, I'm sorry, wait, let me make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah. At the first engagement. So we actually got 72% of those 478 companies to come once. Wow. We're at, that's fantastic. Yeah, 
<laughs> I know. I know. In fact, uh, we had people doubting the 56% number, and I'm happy that we achieved that. For the second step, the repeat engagements were at 81%. And by the way, that's 30, that was 35% of the 56. So we're at 81% of the people who come one time, we're able to get back to come multiple times. We're a little under right now and actively assessing at 27%, but keep in mind, we're halfway through the year, or, you know, eight months and uh, nine months into the year. So we still have some time. So our model turned out to be somewhat accurate, which was pretty amazing because we didn't have a lot of data to work with. Now, for reporting purposes, again, I mentioned we use hockey stack. So if anybody else is using hockey stack, you'll recognize this is a report right out of theirs. We just had to build a funnel that matched all that. So we had to build goals for each of those steps and then filter based on our ICP accounts that we're targeting with this campaign to be able to report. And that allows us to report this out on a weekly basis. So I'm going back to the exec team and saying, here's where we are against our model. So that was new reporting. The th fourth thing that we learned, and this you'll be relieved to know, is you can still get leads even if you engage your content. And this was, this was, I'm going to say this. Wait a minute. Of You're, you can get leads without <laughs> gating your content? That can't you be can. true, Chuck. You can. <laughs> and and I'm going to I'm going to preface this by saying this is an audience of one. Right. And and uh, I'm using the, the book, but we were running ads. We started running a lot of ads on Meta. So we were running on Facebook and stuff like that. I get ads and Meta targeting is shockingly accurate. I get ads all the time for ebooks, research reports and stuff that I would be interested in. But I get them at nine o'clock at night. I'm not reading a research report. I'm not reading an ebook at that point. So what we did was we added on the bottom, you can see where the little cursor is there. We added at the bottom of the each of our ebooks, email a copy of this report. So we we flipped the script. We gave them the content. And then we gave them the option Love of giving that. us their email address if they then wanted to get it via email. So if I get if I come to this, it's nine o'clock at night, I'm gonna give you my email address. And I'm going to, and we don't ask for anything else. We're not asking for company title, all that kind of stuff. And then we send them a copy of the, that so they can look at it the next day. We put them on a sequence. We don't put them on a sales sequence. We put them on content sequence. So if this was Love a, it. we talk about um, um, a content security policy. If they download an ebook on content security policy, we'll send them five emails with additional content about third-party content, content security policies, et cetera, because we want them to come back to the website. We'll be able to see all this in our reporting. So we'll know if they're engaging with that. And they, with their their email address, we can connect it all up with uh, Hockey Stack. I see a question. I see a hand raised. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, I know we're running short on time. Julia, we'll get that to you at the end if we can just okay. get through the slides. I want to make sure you get through them because we do want to be a good stewards of everybody's time here. And worst case, Julia, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, and, and obviously we can continue this conversation in the community too, so. Sure. Good stuff, Chuck, man. This is great. Well, what's interesting is this ebook, and I pulled this data actually in the spring. I haven't updated it yet, but we produced 122 leads in a couple of months this year with this new ebook doing that. And here's the best part. The email addresses are accurate because they have to be. If I'm getting an email to me, it's got to be an email that will reach me, right? So we don't get any bogus emails. So our, our quality went up by... 100% basically. All right. The last lesson that we learned, and this is the hardest one is it's going to require patience and faith to wade into this. Now, again, I'd recommend testing. So you've got some data from yourself, but once you lean in and you do this, you don't know right away because it takes time, right? Remember the 56 touches that it takes people. It takes them a long time for you to start to get proof of life. What was, what was really rewarding was by the end of the year, so I had the whole year to work with, right? But I was reporting along the way. What we saw was our demo requests went up by 265% year over year. We think that's a direct correlation to us getting in front of more people and them learning about it because we weren't stopping them with the gate, right? We weren't preventing them from learning about us. More importantly- that's un Can you just back up one more sure, second? Sure. I mean, that is bravo. I mean, holy moly. You remove the gates, the Linus's blanket, right? We feel like we've got to have the form to get the leads to prove that we're doing our job. You were brave enough to throw the blanket away and say, we're going to give the buyers what they want. And guess, look, look at how you were rewarded. 265% increase in demo requests. And I'm sure a lot of that translated right into pipeline. It did. In fact, that's that's on the next one. Our pipeline grew 242%. Wow. 
And and by the way, unfortunately, what I have not succeeded in getting people to stop thinking about as marketing source pipeline, I, I disagree completely. That's a topic of a whole nother session <laughs> of why we shouldn't be saying that, but this is what we call marketing source pipeline as well. So it's, you know, it's based on where that, where we could tie back to some sort of marketing activity. We saw a four X increase in proof of concepts and a 900% increase in, in POC pipeline. And our closed one revenue went up by 41 X. No big deal. Hey, slow no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> just 41 X for marketing source revenue. I'm going to give the qualification on that. Our revenue didn't go up 41 X as a company, but for what we could tie back to marketing, it was pretty substantial. So we consider that a win. Here's the last data point, And then I, we may actually have a few minutes for questions. Great. Um, you know, again, this 56 touches, the time, the all of that kind of stuff. We were out there doing this all year last year, right? We went out solid all year. And now we come into this year. What's really interesting is in the first half of this year, we've produced 81% of the entire pipeline that we produced last year. Wow. And again, we think that's I what I said. And as soon as we started seeing this happening, I was telling them, this is not so much a function of what we're doing this year. It's what we did last year. It was seeing so the market and getting people aware of us because they have to, it takes time till they're in a buying motion, till they have budget, till they're ready to engage. And so um, this was very encouraging that we were on the right path. Yeah, we Chuck, right what did thing. you say your, your sales cycle length was? Seven months. Yeah, seven million. months. So obviously the stuff you were doing last year is turning into into deals and pipeline this year. Right. Even even the reporting on the last screen, some of that pipeline didn't close until this year. Yeah. I had to see the the extent of all the deals from last year either close or win. Uh, close or win or close one or lost in order to report on that. The other thing that was that's rewarding is Last year, in the first half of the year, about 60% would be ICP in terms of those the pipeline we were creating. This year, that was 90%. So, And, wow. and these are big brands. These are brands you all would know. I, I can't say them, but these are all brands you would likely know that we're trying to get to come in as, and become come into pipeline through our marketing efforts. So overall, very happy. I'm, I'll end there. And again, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect. And I do have a podcast. If you've not seen my coffee cup the whole time, if you are involved in building digital experiences or promoting digital experiences, the, the podcast is all about creating frictionless digital experiences. And we interview, it's mostly interviewing guests. So we interview people from a lot of big consumer brands, some B2B, but we've had, you know, Walmart and American Eagle and Wyndham hotels and, you know, Lowe's and guests like that execs from there. And then of course you're happy. I'm happy. You know, if you want to, by the book available on your at your favorite bookstore. Chuck, great All job. Right. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I'm just blown away. I love the case study. So many good, useful tips here. Um, and I think we do have maybe a couple of minutes. Julia, do you want to come back on and get your question answered? And uh, while you're coming back on, there were a lot of questions about the presentation. There is a link to the slides that Chuck went through in the agenda. Um, and then also, because I know we're probably going to run out of time, um, come join us next month for our jam session. Looking forward to seeing you there as we give you what we learn uh, from inbound next week. Uh, Julia, what was your question? Yeah, I put it in the chat. Um, Chuck, thank you. That was a really uh, fantastic presentation. On the content emails that you mentioned when they, you said, you know, send me an email of the whatever, you know, was, were the series of emails you sent after that more from the context of like, hey, you enjoyed X content, here's why? Or yeah. was it more the marketing nurture? where it's a whole paragraph of information and then, oh, by the way, here's some additional content. So they do come from a person. So they don't come from the info. They come from the SDR. And so, <laughs> and so we position as Scott saying, Hey, thanks. First they get the ebook. Then a day or two later they go, Hey, and since you downloaded that, I thought you might be interested in this blog post. So it's literally oh. that he will uh, on his fourth or fifth email, I'll say he, it's not like he actually wrote it, but <laughs> He will then, you know, introduce the idea. If you want to check out our quick tour, here's a link. And then if you want to schedule time, if you'd like to learn more, I'm happy to reach out. And at this point, we stop at five. We don't bombard them. Because again, I don't sure. believe anybody's ready to buy at that point. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so it's not one of those, again, like, hey, let me tell you, it's like not like a recipe that you see with the blog where it's like, let me tell you my whole life history. No. And then no. there's the second piece of Yeah. We call those like the Hulu's. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Chuck. 
I say they are customized to whatever the ebook is. So yeah. if we have some idea of what they're interested in, we'll try to give them related content. Thank you. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, well, hey, we're at the top of the hour. Chuck, again, thank you. Great job today, sir. Very much appreciate it. My you pleasure. did a wonderful job. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you haven't joined the community, uh, Chuck's on that community. Just follow the link. If you have any other questions, it looks like chat was pretty on fire today. Uh, let's carry on the conversation there in the Demand Gen Jammers uh, community. And then you know how to find Chuck on LinkedIn. And, and uh, be sure to check out his book and check out his podcast. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. Take care.